Okay, so we're looking at motivating employees this morning. Um, and the learning objectives include examining approaches to motivation, understanding the effects of management philosophies on employee motivation, then structuring the work environment to encourage motivation. So we'll be looking at these things. What are the various approaches that a manager can use to motivate employees? How will your management philosophy influence the way you motivate your employees? And how do you structure your work environment in order to motivate or encourage motivation at the workplace? Okay, so organizations need employees who are committed and motivated and who want to do their jobs well. So for every organization with length, organizations are set up to achieve certain objectives and they rely on their employees in order to achieve these particular objectives. Okay, if these employees are not motivated to work hard, it will normally be very, very difficult for these organizations to achieve their objectives. So one of the key function or sub role that a leader need to focus on is how to motivate employees. So leaders or managers must create an environment so that he or she will be able to direct human behavior towards the attainment of the objectives or goals of the organization. Without this, all the other functions may be working well, but because the employees are not motivated enough, they will not help the organization achieve its objectives. Okay, so that brings us to the definition or the explanation of the concept of uh, motivation. What is it? So motivation is defined as the force that causes an individual to behave in a specific way. Okay, so let's pay attention to this uh, definition that motivation is a force. There is some force, there is some pressure that will cause an individual to behave in a specific way. You will realize that it's a neutral force. What that means is that motivation has a direction. You could be motivated to do the wrong things or you could be motivated to do the right things. Okay, so there is a force. There is some en energy or intensity involved and it also has some direction. So whenever the word motivated is used, don't always assume that it is positive. Okay, somebody can be motivated to wear a vest, a suicide vest to, to kill uh, other human beings. That is motivation. Okay, another will be motivated to jump into a river in order to save the life of, of someone who is drowning. That is also motivation. So motivation has direction. It could be used either for a positive cause or it can be used for a negative cause. It is a force. So it is up to the manager to redirect this force in the workplace, at the workplace, so that uh, employees who want to work hard at their job, because if somebody is not motivated, they will at best do the minimal that they can and, and leave the workplace. Okay. So as a manager, it is very, very important to know how to push this force or drive this force towards the goals and the objectives of your organization. And that is actually stimulating or encouraging employees to work hard in order to be able to achieve these objectives. All right. Largely, motivation, motivation is an internal process. Okay, so the manager will have done something externally, but what will cause the person then to behave or react towards what the manager or the leader has done or the environment has done. Normally, it comes as a result of the thinking process that the person has gone through. Okay, so it's internal. It's, it's how you process whatever is being done to you that will cause you to, to be motivated, either to do good or to do bad, all right? So there's some thinking process. There's some cognitive process involved. And it's based on your interpretation of whatever is happening in your environment that will then cause you to behave. And it's the behavior that is external. It is that which is seen. But before you behave, 
some thinking will have taken place, which is the internal processes. Okay, so largely it is an internal process. So we're looking at the approaches or theories. Okay, so we have motivation theories that focus on needs known as content theories. Then we also have motivation theories that focus on process or behavior, also known as process theories. Okay, so when we come to the process theory, I'll explain later, but it focuses on behavior, it kind of gives some, um, not too much clarity because needs theories also focus on behavior. The only thing is that when it comes to the process theory, normally, as I explained, the concept of the fact that motivation is an internal process, it normally focuses on the cognitive process and the perception of employees rather than the needs of the employees. We'll come to the process theories, all right? But let's now draw our attention on to um, the content theories. So there are two broad classifications of motivation theories. We have the content theories and we have the process theories. The content theories try to focus on the needs of employees or whoever you're seeking to motivate. Okay, so the theories together uh, acknowledge that or identify that people have needs. And as a manager or a leader, if you were to find out the needs of these people and you were to satisfy those needs, you are likely to motivate them or you will be able to motivate them to achieve whatever you want them to achieve. Okay, so all of the content theories, and we'll be looking at them uh, from one to four. They are based on the premise that people have needs. And if you address these needs of people, then you are better placed to be able to motivate them or influence them to do whatever that you want. Okay, and I think in our everyday life, we, we experience that like, right? When you're dealing with, with your child, if you know that that child needs something and you also want the child to do something for you, normally it's a bargain. You promise the child that you do this if he or she was to do what you want the person to do, okay, or your, your child to do. So that is the whole idea of content theories. People have needs. Some of these needs may be physiological needs. Some of these needs may be psychological or emotional needs. Whatever be the case, human beings have needs. And as a manager or a leader, if you were to satisfy these needs, then you are better positioned to be able to motivate them to do what you want them to do for you. Okay, so let's look at some of the theorists or contributors of the content theories of motivation. So we have the leading person. I'm sure by now you've heard the name or you've heard it somewhere. So we have the Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs theory. We have Hesbeck's two-factor theory. We have Aldifier's ERG theory. Then we have McLellan's acquired needs theory. Okay, so I said, what is common to all of them is the fact that they're focusing on the needs of people. So let's look at them one by one. So Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Abraham Maslow defined need as a physiological or psychological deficiency that a person feels the compulsion to satisfy. Okay, so a need is either physiological or psychological deficiency. Physiological could be tangible, physical, right? The person needs food to eat. Food is not psychological. It is tangible. It's something that you can feel and touch. And so if you are hungry, that means that you have need for food, okay? Some of these needs may not also be physical, like clothing or food or water but they could be psychological. What it means is that they are not tangible. They are not things that we can see. For example, they need to belong or they need to be loved. Okay, the, the quest to be accepted, to be appreciated, it's not tangible. It's not physical. You can't give money to somebody to satisfy that needs. You can't give somebody clothing 
to satisfy that need because that need is psychological. It is emotional. Okay. But whatever be the case, whenever there is deprivation of either physiological or phys physiological needs, then that creates some compulsion in people to want to satisfy that particular need. And as a manager or a leader, you can ride on this desire or compulsion to influence people to do whatever you want them to do for you. As I said in the example, we all use this, this theory one way or the other, right? You just have to find out what people need. And then you can project yourself as somebody who can provide or satisfy that need. And that helps you to be able to influence the person. Okay. Maslow formed a theory based on his view that humans are motivated by multiple needs and that these needs exist in hierarchical order, right? So either physiological or psychological, we have several needs, but these needs, according to Maslow, are in the form of a hierarchy. And we all know a hierarchy, right? You There is a lower level, you proceed from that to the next, to the next, until you get to the apex of that particular hierarchy. That is how he saw the needs of people, that we have needs, but these needs are multiple, and these needs are in the form of a hierarchy. His premise is that only an unsatisfied need can influence behavior. A satisfied need is not a motivator. All right, so it is important for us to pay attention to this as well as managers or potential managers. That even though people have needs, you don't assume everybody will have the same type of need. And once something is no longer a need for somebody, all right, they have satisfied that, then that very factor ceases to be a source of motivation for the person. So once again, if you remember our situational leadership style where you need to pay attention to individuals, that is where this idea is coming from. Once a need is satisfied, it ceases to become a motivating variable. So for example, at the workplace, whilst um, your junior staff or the cleaners and those at the low rank may be, may be excited with you providing something, uh, providing them something for lunch, or providing them with lunch itself, that is not the same thing with the senior members or the people at the, at the higher levels of the organization. In fact, if you were to give them money for lunch, they will consider that as an insult and, and you are likely to have a problem with them, okay? So you need to know what unsatisfied needs that your people have because that is only, uh, the opportunity that you have as a manager to be able to influence these guys, okay? If you want to influence them or motivate them with what they already have, it will be very, very difficult because according to Maslow, it is only a satisfied need that can influence the behavior of people, okay? So Maslow's theory is based on the following two principles. Point one, he talks about the deficit principle. A satisfied need no longer motivates behavior because people act to satisfy deprived needs, all right? So once that need is satisfied, then the person has no urge to be looking for that particular thing anymore. But once that need is not satisfied, then you stimulate or cause the person to find ways to be able to satisfy that particular need. Point two, principle two says, Progression principle. The five needs he identified ex exist in the hierarchy, which means that a need at any level only comes into play after a lower level need has been satisfied. Okay, so if somebody is still at the lower level, the person is thinking about the lower level staff. Until those needs are satisfied, the person doesn't actually project to the next level. All right. Probably let's just look at the hierarchy and that might help us. I didn't draw that, but we can look at uh, this table here. So we have physiological needs. Ordinarily, this will be need for, say, food, water. Um, yes, things like that. Accommodation. Okay. So the, the argument with the progression principle is that 
until people satisfy the needs for food, water, and, and accommodation or shelter, they won't move to the next stage, which is safety needs. Okay, so let's run through the five needs. He spoke about physiological needs. After physiological needs, you go to safety needs. From safety needs, you go to social needs. From social needs, you now aspire for esteem needs. After you have attained esteem needs, you'll now be thinking about what is known as self-actualization needs. Okay, so if you find yourself at the physiological level, according to Maslow, until you've satisfied all that, you don't normally think about the next stage. All right. And, and normally I use the example, if you go to a community where the people are relatively poor, you will notice that for most of the houses, they don't even close their, door, their doors when they, they, when they sleep, either daytime or nighttime. Anybody who has visited a village like that before, Okay, sometimes you, you go to the compound looking for somebody or asking for something. You, you scream, uh, nobody's in the house, but all the doors are opened. All right, because at that point of their life, safety needs haven't yet been activated. Okay, probably they are more thinking about food, they are thinking about water, they are thinking about shelter. And they are not really bothered about security. What is actually in the room for, for you to come and stop? Okay. I don't know whether you've had this experience before, but I have. So that is the idea of the progression. Once you satisfy the physiological needs, then you start thinking about safety needs. So those who have money, those who don't have any concern for food, for water, if you go to the East Lagos and all those kind of places, all right, you realize that safety needs become very, very important because they have acquired a lot of wealth now and they are thinking about their safety. They don't want to die and leave their wealth, all right? So they have a wall around their houses. They have, what again, security men. Uh, they have... Uh, ele electronic wire, security wires all over the house. And if you were even to succeed and get to their rooms, you might be unfortunate as a thief because they may have pistols uh, under their pillows or somewhere in their rooms as well. Okay, so they have satisfied physiological needs. And what has been activated at st that stage is what is known as the safety needs. They are now concerned about their lives, about their properties, and so on and so forth. Okay. Once safety needs has been achieved, <clears throat> according to Maslow, what the next need that comes to place, what is known as social needs, the need to love and be loved, the need to belong, that becomes very, very important for people at this stage, those that have satisfied their physiological safety needs, all right? So they, they get into all kinds of associations and, and societies because they want that uh, friendliness, they want to belong, they want to be powerful, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this one, I won't go so deep, but the whole idea is that once safety needs are satisfied, people now want the need to belong and they need to be loved and they need to love and so on and so forth. Okay, then, so, but all the three, Maslow sees them to be what he classified as the lower level needs. Okay, so he says, these are base needs. These are things that you just have to get as a human being to, to live a normal kind of life. Okay, but to live an impactful life, then you should be thinking about higher level needs, all right? And most of the time, if you understand this theory proper, you, you, you wonder why politicians in developing countries um, will still be operating at the lower level. Because most of the time, all of the corruption and the thievery and all those things that are coming up is because people have not moved from even physiological needs, okay, and, and safety needs. 
So they want to steal as much as they can so that they can feel secure they and their family and their grandchildren and all that. And so when they get positions, instead of operating at the higher levels of needs level, they will still be operating most of the time and between safety and physiological. How can we save or how much can we still so that we can feel safe after we've lost power or after we've left power. Okay, so most governments, most especially in developing countries, unfortunately, are not operating, thinking about how to satisfy higher levels needs. Most of the time, they are the lower levels needs. Okay, and as an individual as well, if you don't take time, that is how you operate. You always be thinking about bread and butter issues and security issues without really thinking about how to make an impact, okay? And that is the higher levels needs according to Maslow. So let's look at them. So esteem needs, they need to be recognized, the need for respect. Um, they need to feel that you are important. It's what it calls the esteem needs. And this need will drive you to be able to do something that is very, very important that will be beneficial to society because you want to be recognized, you want to be appreciated as a human being. All right. So if we had politicians that aspire to meet their esteem needs, instead of actually stealing and looting our monies, they will actually be thinking about, about projects or a legacy that, that they can leave behind, say that. 50 years from now, when they are gone, the, the next generation will come and keep mentioning their name and so on and so forth. All right. So you see how that needed. You raise it to so you want to lift yourself up beyond the basic needs of life. And now you're thinking about how you you'll be recognized. You're thinking about your reputation, your name, how to leave a legacy, as I explained much earlier. Okay, and employees at the workplace also have this type of needs as well. Then we have the last level. He calls the self-actualization needs. Okay, so this is the stage of almost self-fulfillment where you feel that you'll be able to use all of the potentials and the abilities within you. So self-actualization doesn't actually mean you have become the president of the country or the CEO of your company. No, that is not the idea. Self-actualization is where you feel within you, you are satisfied because you feel all the abilities and the potentials that you have as an, a human being has been utilized to the best or to the maximum. Okay, so it brings about contentment in life. Okay, so once again, if you go back to our politicians as I was talking about, you see all the grabbing and the stealing and all that. It just tells you they have no yet self-actualized. So you can be president, you can become a minister. In fact, the contentment will take away the desire to steal and to acquire more material resources. All right. I don't know whether you've experienced that before, but if you meet a very self-actualized person, those, those things don't move them anymore because they feel they have made their, their impact in this life and in the lives of other people. Okay, so generally, that's Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. Humans have physiological needs. After these needs have been met, they move to their uh, safety needs. They want to feel safe. After safety needs have been met, they move to social needs. They want to love and be loved. They want to belong to groups and associations. Then after social needs have been met, they want recognition. So that is esteem needs. Then after that, at the apex, they want self-actualization needs. So these are the needs of people. And according to Maslow, if you're a manager, find a way to address these needs. And by doing so, you bet you are better positioned to be able to influence them to do what you want. Okay, so at the workplace, when we pick the physiological level, how can you address that as a manager? So you can provide rest and refreshment breaks, okay, or fiscal comfort on the job, all right? I don't know how many of you, where you work, whether you have a canteen for, for your workers, 
okay but if you go to some institutions yes they have canteen they may be charging but normally at a very subsidized price compared to open market right if you go to the ordinary market to buy you may pay, pay higher than buying from the canteen of the part of that organization okay others may say it's free but probably they may deduct it from source or stuff like that whatever be the case refreshments breaks rest providing food and things like that can help in addressing the physiological needs of workers uh, at the workplace okay so if you're a manager and you've identified that you have some group of people that are struggling with what to eat and things like that that is one way proposed way by which you can get these people motivated okay and in our context those if you, if you are able to provide food, it's almost like being the messiah to some of the workers that we have, okay? Because food is really a challenge even at home. So if we can come to work and you can provide food, that is enough for the person to come to work and give his or a maximum best. So as a manager, know that people have these needs, okay? At the workplace, how do you deal with safety needs? So provide safe working conditions, provide job security. So safe working conditions could be say providing protective clothing, if they say mining or any of those dangerous kind of work, then the type of attire that your employees wear, it is very, it will be very, very important, all right? For majority of employees, how to address their safety needs is to be more concerned about job security. The person shouldn't feel he or she can be dismissed at any point in time. All right. He should have this peace of mind, knowing that his or employer won't just get up one day and say that you are fired. So that is the safety needs within the context of the workplace. All right. So unionization may be social needs, but also if you allow for unions to be in order for them to be able to defend their colleagues that can also help in, in boosting the safety needs of employees at the workplace, okay? So as a manager, note that these two strategies can help in satisfying these particular needs. Then social needs, how do you satisfy that at the workplace? <clears throat> Encourage friendly co-workers, like friendliness at the workplace, right? Workplace um, happiness, workplace friendliness, things like that, okay? So that employees will feel that they are people to interact with and to confide in when they come to the workplace. Then I love for interactions with workers. Sometimes the nature of the work is such that the employees are not even men, right? If you have, say, a pharmacy, right maximum there are about five or so people that will be in that pharmacy so the people that the employees have the opportunity to interact with most of the time are the customers or the clients that come to the uh, to the pharmacy to buy their drugs or medicine okay so by allowing interactions then that helps in fulfilling the social needs of these employees then you must learn to be a pleasant supervisor okay don't come to work and be abusing your your subordinates you can never tell what people are dealing with when when in their private lives so if they come to work and you become a terror and keep abusing them and so especially those that are far lower than you all right there's no point you it, it, it doesn't speak i don't know it doesn't add anything to you Already, you are far be beyond the person. What you should be doing is to show empathy to people that are far, far below you. That is not the time to, to prove that you are higher, you are better. If you're, you're doing that to your colleagues, I, I, I am fine with that, or even though that is not also right, but it's far, far better than doing that to people that are still far, far, far below you. There is no point in trying to prove that point. So become a pleasant supervisor become a pleasant manager and that will help in fulfilling the social needs of your employees okay esteem needs how do you satisfy that at the workplace responsibility of an important job so make employees responsible for important aspects of the job 
so that a person can say uh, boastfully that he contributed to a significant part of a particular product or service that that organization is, is rendering. Okay. So it shouldn't be, the job shouldn't be, I, I, I spoke to you at, at the other time or gave the example of people whose job may entail just closing envelopes and probably writing addresses. At the back of the envelopes. Okay. Uh, initially, it might be okay because the person is getting paid. But with time, the person will start questioning the impact he's making with that type of job. What real contribution is he making to life and making to his customers and society with that particular job? So give assignment that comes with responsibility. Give assignment that provides what is known as meaning provide what is known as meaningful jobs so that people will feel that they are making impact on society, all right? The other way is by promotion to higher status job. So promotion is another important way by which you can build the self-esteem needs of your employees, all right? So don't deliberately. Uh, so this is not like promoting anybody, whether the person is qualified or not. This is about people that are qualified and make sure only those who are qualified are promoted so that that challenge itself to get promotion becomes a motivational factor. But when people have struggled and met the requirement, you shouldn't become the manager or the leader that will be sitting on, so to speak, the promotion of people, seeking to frustrate people. That is not leadership. That is not the way good managers are supposed to manage. All right, you must seek to promote people that are qualified in order to boost the, their esteem needs. Okay, self actualization needs. I said this, uh, this is the stage where you feel that your potentials are being utilized, your abilities are being brought to work, and so it makes you satisfied. And I also emphasize that it doesn't necessarily mean that you have become the president or the CEO of your company. Wherever that you find yourself, if you realize that your abilities, your potentials are being used the very maximum, it is possible to self-actualize at that particular stage. Okay, and I've heard about situations where people have been given promotion and they have declined because they are much, much okay with the current state of status of their job than at the higher level. Why? Because they feel that whatever with, is within them, they are capable of doing at the current stage or, or status of that particular job or the assignment that they are engaged in, okay? So don't interpret self-actualization to mean when you've gotten to the highest level of your organization. No, that is not it, all right? You can be a teacher and, and be self-actualized. Somebody can be a professor and not be self-actualized. You can be, uh, what again? Even the cleaner at the workplace, right? And self-actualized. Because based on your abilities and potential, you feel that the workplace is allowing you to use all of that. And you can be a president of that company and not be self-actualized. Okay. So let's come back to how to satisfy this thing at the workplace. So provide creative and challenging work. I said it's about utilization of the abilities and potentials of people. So if you want people to self-actualize at your workplace, provide them with creative and challenging work that will tap into their potentials and their abilities. Okay, Allow for participation in decision-making. Then the guys feel that their knowledge, their skill set, and their abilities are being used. All right, but if you always seek to direct and, and control them, then they will never get to the point where they will be self-actualized. But if they become active participants in decision-making, then they feel that they are important, they are contributing a lot, and that means that all their abilities are actually being deployed by the organization. Okay, very closely, allow for job flexibility and autonomy, right? Allow the employees... And here, once again, pay attention to situational leadership. Allow doesn't mean any type of employee at all. You need to be able to identify who 
type of employee should be allowed job flexibility and autonomy, okay? We spoke about mature employees, those that have been acquired a lot of experience over a period of time. It doesn't necessarily mean they have been in the company for a long time because some don't learn on the job. Somebody can just come in a year or two and learn far more than somebody who has been with the company or the organization for five years, all right? So it is not really about years, but, <clears throat> but how well the employee has been able to develop or groom themselves. Once you allow such employees job flexibility and autonomy, you can help them to self-actualize. Okay, any, any questions at this stage before we proceed? Any comment, any question? Are we fine? Yes, we are fine, Prof. Okay. So that is that for Maslow. So we move to the next uh, contributor of the content theory, theories of motivation. And that's this Hesbeck's, Hesbeck's two-factor theory. And it's two-factor theory. Hesbeck identifies two sets of factors that impact motivation in the workplace. So the whole idea is uh, that Hesbeck's two-factor theory really have it has some relationship with Abraham Maslow. And he came out with this theory based on his argument that it is possible two or more needs can be activated at the same time. Okay, if you remember Maslow's explanation, we had five types of needs. These needs are in the form of a hierarchy. One, the lower level need must be satisfied before the next level of need is activated and so on and so forth. So Hesbeck's argument is that it is possible to have two or three needs activated at the same time. And I think it makes sense. So you can have the problem, uh, problem with food, that is hunger, shelter, and at the same time be concerned about security. Okay, I gave the rare example of where if you don't have food and clothing, you will not really mind be concerned about security. But there will also be situations where you will be concerned about food, water, basic stuffs, and yet be also be concerned about safety needs. So his argument is it's possible to have these needs that have been identified by Maslow, two or three of them act being activated at the same time. So he tried to regroup the needs that employees could have at the workplace into two cl classifications instead of the five that Maslow uh, initially brought to us. Okay, we'll come to that. So hygiene factors. So all, all these guys have their roots from, from Maslow's needs. So let's say he spoke about hygiene. Although these factors do not motivate employees, they can cause dissatisfaction if they are missing. They include salary, job security, working conditions, organizational policies, and technical quality of supervision. So he regrouped the needs of people into two. He called some hygiene factors, then he called some satisfiers or motivators. Okay, his argument is that the hygiene factors are not really motivators, but their absence will bring about job dissatisfaction. So let me break it down. What he's saying is that there are some factors that if you provide for your employees or subordinates, those factors by themselves, those factors by themselves, will not motivate the employee to work hard. But if those variables are not available at the workplace, the person will not come to the workplace in the first place. Or the person will be dissatisfied if even he comes to the workplace. Okay? So he, he spoke about things like salary, job security, working conditions, organizational policies, and technical quality of supervision. So his argument is that the fact that somebody's paid good salary will not motivate the person to work hard. But if the person is not paid well, the person might come to work 
But apart from the fact that the person is not motivated to work out, the person is actually dissatisfied with the work that he or she is doing. Is the explanation clear? <laughs> Prof is confusing. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> I can't imagine being paid and I'll not be motivated. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, so whenever you teach this in African context, <laughs> the reaction you get. Because people <laughs> feel that why should salary be placed under hygiene factor? Okay. But if you have paid attention, most of the time when they increase salary, is is the first two, three weeks or a uh, first two, three months. Okay. That that the, you become excited after six <laughs> months, you, you see that they are normal, you come to normalcy <laughs> exactly. And you'll now be thinking about the following year what kind of negotiation can go on for you to increase your salary? Okay, so that's the idea. All right, so he says, if you are not paid good salary, you will not come to work, or you, you'll come to work but dissatisfied. What it means is that probably your productivity will be negative, all right? You will not work. You will not just pay attention to work so much. But if you are paid well as well, you will operate at a normal level. Let me just put it that way so that you understand, okay? So salary, job security, working conditions in general, even though there are needs that people have, if you were to satisfy these needs, have good policies in place, supervision was okay, those variables or factors by themselves will not motivate employees. But they are, they are supposed to be there first and foremost to prevent job dissatisfaction. Are we clear? Before I proceed, are we fine? Yes, sir. Who said yes, sir? Please excuse me. I want your name. <laughs> Akosia. Okay, so Akosia, explain the hygiene factors for me. If you have understood it, how did you understand it? Yeah. Um, so if you just what I have understand is that mm -hmm. and me your line is breaking your line is breaking maybe if you are at a workplace and there's no um maybe a work hello hello yeah it's better hello sir yes it's okay. better now yeah so please what i was saying is that um if you are you know you are at your workplace Mm -hmm. And maybe you, you don't have a you don't have a a clean washroom, you don't have a canteen. Those things do not necessarily motivate you to work. Mm -hmm. But it demotivates you in a way that maybe I'm going to work. As mm -hmm. I'm working, I'm stressed about the fact that so right now when I'm pressed, how where would I even go to urinate? Exactly. Even though it doesn't yes, that's what that's how I am. Oh, continue. I didn't hear you stop. <laughs> <laughs> Even though, <laughs> even though it's not a motivating factor for me mm -hmm. to work, but mm -hmm. some, somehow it dissatisfies me. Like it gives me some kind of discomfort with the work. Good. So if it is not there, it brings discomfort, right? But its presence by uh, does that not really, motivated. it does not count that much. It it doesn't really yes. motivate you to work harder. But if it is absent then it brings discomfort. So it brings you, the presence of those things brings you to the normal level, right? Normal. You don't really do anything extra. You just do what is required because at least you have the washrooms and all the working conditions and so on and so forth. You have AC or fan at your office and stuff like that. Okay. So that's the argument of the hygiene factors. So a classified job security, salary, working conditions and i like the reaction when salary came in okay and that's the reason is that because we are not paid well we, we most of the time attach a lot of importance to money but i just explained that most of the time it is just the first three months or six months that you become excited afterwards 
things adjust, price of things go up and all that, and you almost forget that your salary went up, okay? So it is not really a motivator. It is classified under hygiene factors. Then we have the satisfiers or motivators. So they are the key, they are the key to job satisfaction and motivation. They include side things as responsibility, achievement, growth opportunities, and feelings of recognition. Okay. So he argues that the real motivators at the workplace are these things. The fact that I have a I feel a sense of responsibility for a particular tax. The fact that I feel a sense of achievement at the place where I work, all the things that I do, the fact that I see growth opportunities, and the fact that I feel recognized for my contributions, these are the real things that motivate employees at the workplace. Agusia, exactly. Hello. Oh, prof, please. Yes. So please, this Evelyn, please, I strongly agree with this one. Mm -hmm. yes. Why? Yeah. Evelyn, your line is breaking. But, sir, please, I actually agree with this particular one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I was, I was once, personally, I was <laughs> once. <laughs> I was ah, once here who before. Who is laughing? Why? Where, are you at the same <laughs> workplace? Hello. <laughs> Hello, sir. Somebody was laughing when you were talking. Who is that? I could see. <laughs> oh, okay. But I thought the person the person was your colleague at work, so she knew what you Oh were no, no. Okay. I don't so know. You can I continue. Say. All right. Yes. I'm saying I personally agree with this this theory, the satisfying mm -hmm. and motivated theory, yes. Yeah. Because personally I was once there and now I've moved from that level to feeling responsible at work mm -hmm. and uh, noticing that you have you have grown yeah beyond a certain state i think it's, mm -hmm. it's it's a personal feeling and i think it's better than all the salaries and the conditions that we earlier talked about that, that's right that's right but can and you I, can I'm you give us the specifics that... will you or uh, you don't want to share the private ones we want to have oh. a sense of what you call maybe you're now responsible for something greater. Okay, so I once worked under a certain head, mm -hmm. and he he feels he feels that he knows it all. Let me let me just put it that way for That's lack right. of better words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he wouldn't assign you to any work. Uh, at that time, I hadn't even attained my first degree. Right. He wouldn't assign you to any work because uh, most of the guys are far lower than him. Mm -hmm. But later on, when we had another boss, he brought everybody along. Right. He will assign a work to you. If you're not able to do it, he guide you. That's right. And through that, through that, I've I've been able to grow, and I now have responsibilities on my own that I do, and uh, I think I'm growing. That's right. <laughs> as, That's as simple right. as That's that. Right. Good, good. So good. I, I I would like to ask whether this one could be related to Maslow's self actualization theory, where Beautiful. you feel that. Mm -hmm. Where you okay. feel that now um, you you have recognition, That's so right. it's it's a it's a form of self actualization in a way. That's right. Can it also be related to? Yes. It? So if you have paid attention to the two, the hygiene factors really apply to okay. Maslow's lower level. Okay. 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 And if you pay attention to the satisfiers or motivators, they are more applicable to Maslow's higher level needs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. all the, the examples that we find under hygiene, they are things that if you, if you pay close attention, there are stuff that will fall from social needs to physiological needs. Okay. All the okay. salary, good working conditions, job security, all those things. All right. Mm -hmm. And if you have paid mm -hmm. attention to the examples that we are giving, and the motivators, they fall under what they call the higher levels needs. So the okay. esteem needs and self-actualization combined. 
Okay, so yes, yes. Maslow laid the, the foundation as I was trying to explain earlier, but all the other theories have some relationship with him. Okay, so the hygiene factors are like the Maslow's lower level of needs and the satisfiers and motivators are the high um, level of needs, higher order needs of people. Okay, is that point clear? Yes, sir. it's, it's okay. clear. Right. So following Hesbeck's two-factor theory, managers need to ensure that hygiene factors are adequate and then build satisfiers into jobs. So the satisfiers normally will be found in the nature of the job itself, okay? Is the job in such a way that you have the independence, autonomy to be able to make decisions? As Evelyn was talking about, do you feel a sense of achievement when a particular job is done? Do you see growth opportunities in the kind of jobs that you're doing and so on and so forth? So the satisfiers and motivators really can be built into the kind of work that people do at the workplace, all right? The hygiene factors are there to prevent job dissatisfaction. But if you have them in place as a manager, you don't have to get excited because they are not the real motivators. All right. So we move to Aldifier's ERG theory. Once again, the explanation is just similar. The fact that two or more needs can be activated at the same time. And, and also he regrouped the needs into three. All right. So the earlier explanation that I actually gave is more applicable to the ERG. So the existence needs now is like the physiological and the safety needs of Maslow. So people have existence needs, which are desires for physiological and material well-being. So Eldify actually combined the physiological needs and safety needs of people and decided to call it existence needs. Okay, then you have relatedness needs. There's desires for satisfying interpersonal relationship. So that is also equivalent to the social needs of Abraham Maslow. Then he has his last one that he calls growth needs. And that is the continual desire for psychological growth and development. And that will be the combination of esteem needs and self-actualization needs of Maslow. Okay, so the next, the, you realize that the needs theory is really most, uh, except, uh, for example, the last one that is radically different. The, the two, Hesbeck's two-factor theory and um, Eldify's ERG, they all relied on, on Maslow to be able to come up with this, this particular needs. Okay, so the existence needs is almost like the physiological needs and safety needs. People want to exist. People want to feel safe. And so as a manager, if you were to satisfy these needs, you can. The only difference is what I said earlier. He argued that two or more needs could be activated at the same time. So he actually combined physiological and safety needs. When he got to the growth needs, he decided to combine, uh, what do you call it, a scene and self-actualization it, okay? The other difference is between Eldify, ERG, and Maslow is that Maslow argue, argued for what is known as satisfaction progression, okay? Uh, what it means is that if you satisfy lower level needs, you move to the next, to the next until you get to self-actualization. Eldify says we can have what is known as frustration retrogression, okay? And he argues that it is not as if you continue until you get to self-actualization. If you get frustrated uh, trying to achieve a higher level need, there is the temptation or there is the tendency for you to retrogress or come back to a lower level need. So it is not straight line that people just progress until they get to self-actualization but there's also the tendency of you retrogressing or coming back to a lower level need when your effort at achieving a higher level need is frustrated, all right? Most of the time, the classroom environment in uh, among, um, what do you call it? Uh, the first degree guys, okay? What I normally use is, is uh, guys 
that then forget the advice that their parents gave them when they were coming to school and they start chasing girls, right? When they go and they are bounced, they now remember the advice that they were given when, when they were coming to school. They need to pay attention <laughs> uh -huh, to their books and all that. Yes, so they come to their senses. So in their bid to satisfy their social needs, when they get bounced, they come back to their physio physiological needs and know that they are, they are here to study and not to, to be chasing around. So that is that is the example I normally use. And, and they kind of relate or pick pick that up quickly. Okay, so I hope I hope this is clear. This is also clear, right? Okay, so we move to the last um, content theory, and the content theories, and this is by Mac David McLellan's acquired needs theory. So he recognizes that people have needs, and he classified this needs into three, three specific needs. He says we have the need for achievements, we have people with the need for power, and we have people with the need for affiliation. Okay, so his needs are more of psychological needs. They are not, they don't include the existence or the physiological, no. He talks about the fact that there are some category of people, they have what is known as the need for achievements, Okay, I just wanted to be sure whether I've explained this in the next slide. So we have some category of people that have need for achievement. And that is they have a big or huge drive to excel. So as a manager, you need to know that you have this type of people at your workplace and know how to motivate them. Okay, so they are not people. Okay, so let's let's run them through and later we'll come to look at how to motivate them each. Then we have those with need for power. So we have people that have desire to cause others to behave in a way that that they will not have behaved otherwise. So we have people that have the desire to control um, if you want, manipulate others to do what they want. At the workplace, they have, they have, we have some people like that. Then at the workplace, you have people with the need for affiliation. Okay, so they have the desire for friendship, close interpersonal relationships, and they try to avoid conflict as much as possible because they have high need for affiliation. Okay, if you have a friend like that, there are people that you can offend. And if you ignore them for one or two days, they will come back and be apologizing and all that, even though you are the one who has offended them. Okay, because they have need for affiliation. They have need for friendship. They value friendship and they cannot really tolerate conflict. So they try and settle their differences as quickly as they can. Okay, so this, this McLellan, it is the only theory that is a bit separated or different from what Maslow and other guys sought to do, okay, because they are largely psychological. So he says that as a manager, know that at the workplace, you have some people that have huge need for achievement. They have a great desire and interest in excellence. They want to excel at everything that they do. The question is, how do you motivate these people as a manager at the workplace? Okay, so they love to take more challenging assignments. They, they, if you're giving them an assignment, it shouldn't be easy. If it is easy, you will demotivate them. All right? And then, yeah, if we all had colleagues like that in our class. When you write exams and the questions are too cheap, they come back worried. Okay, why? Because people that didn't study like them are likely to get the same grade as them, and they are not happy about that. So those with the need for achievement are people that desire excellence and don't normally want challenging tasks and assignments, okay? There are also people that tend to want individualized tasks. You see, normally with group work, you have, in the group, you have average people, right? And, and those that are not serious at all. And, and if you find 
a high achiever or people with high need for achievement among these people, they get frustrated. Most of the time, even though it's a group assignment, they may end up doing the work themselves because first they have desire to excel and also because they cannot tolerate average people or weak people in terms of their, their drive to achieve. Okay, recently I, I think I saw a post on Facebook of um, this Opoku are a guy. Uh, is I think he's Steven, right? A first year student. Were you following Brilliant Science and Math? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, sir. yes. In yes. his first year, yes. competed well. I hear is he was never substituted. When when no. he been the, he has the, had the um, opportunity the throughout the yes, okay, yes. he took his school to the very finals, even though they were third, but they did exceptionally well. And he, in particular, yeah. given that he's just a first year student, okay, but exactly. because they didn't win, he was crying. Okay, <laughs> and I was reading the comments under that post, and and most people were actually praising him and telling him he has done well and so on and so forth but he's a classic example of somebody with need for achievement all right mm -hmm. side that if they don't win the, their target nothing else makes them satisfied they are not the average ordinary people so these are the type of people that want um want to very challenging assignments and they also have a strong desire to to excel so first give them challenging tasks or assignments secondly make sure you most of the time give them individualized assignments so that they can feel accountable and responsible for the attainment of that particular or completion of that particular assignment okay so we have to know as potential managers that you will or you may get to meet such employees and you have to know that how to motivate them and how to motivate them is not to give them your everyday average work but they want something more challenging challenging doesn't mean impossible right if it's impossible and they also feel that no matter how they work they won't be able to achieve that then they won't do it but it should be challenging in the sense that if they put in their maximum best they should be able to get the results that is needed, okay? Then we have the second category of people, those with the need for power. I said there are those that want to lead, there are those that want to coach, there are those that want to supervise. In fact, they want to control other people, to put it bluntly, okay? So you will have people like that at the workplace also. If, if they find themselves among five people, before the discussion will be over, you will see them assigning work and, and controlling and directing people, even though nobody has voted them uh, as the leader of the group. They will take the leadership upon, upon themselves. Okay? So we have people like that <laughs> at the workplace. Why are you laughing? You know the folks like that, isn't it? They are everywhere. <laughs> Okay. Yes, yes, yes. I have people. I have people close to me like that. Yes. <laughs> and in every group, they are there, right? <laughs> so if you have about two or three of them in the same group, there will always be war, huh? Because everybody wants some form of loyal loyalty or followership. All right. But whether we like it or not, that is the need of some people. They have the need to control others. They have the need to lead others. And as a manager, how do you um, use these needs of theirs to satisfy or meet the needs of the organization? Okay. And as I indicated, they don't work well as followers. They work better as leaders. So if it is a group work and you want them to achieve result, make them the team leader. Okay. They will force the others to work to get you the results that you want. But if you don't know and you don't pick such people as leaders and you pick other people, they will frustrate the leader you have appointed until the whole work becomes a failure, okay? They will, <laughs> after meetings, they will also call their own meeting and tell them, see, this is our leader, it's not correct, that and that and that and that. 
Okay. Exactly. So, so the best approach is to make them responsible. And if they are the in charge, then they will force the others to work in order to be able to achieve the objective that you want. So that is how to motivate and to use such people in, at your workplace. Once again, remember situational leadership. People are not the same. They have different needs. And as a good manager or leader, all that you have to be do is to be observant and see who has what need and try and use feed on that need of theirs to motivate them to do what you want. Okay? So we have people with need for power. Don't try to tame or control that because that is their nature. Just use that in order to be able to achieve the result that you want as a leader or as a manager. Okay, I hope that is clear. Then in the third category of people, we have those with need for affiliation. So they love friendship, they value interpersonal relationships. So these are people that work well in groups and in teams. They are almost the opposite of those with need for achievement. If you remember the need for achievement, guys, I said there are people that will work better when you give them individualized assignments and, and make them accountable for it. With those with need for affiliation, they, they fear uh, loneliness, okay? So they can't deal with assignments where they have to do it all by themselves. They tend to work better when they are given group tax or group assignments. So if you want to get the best out of people with such needs, that is what you should be doing as a manager. Make sure you provide them with assignments that they will have the opportunity to interact and talk to other people. In the course of the interaction, they also tend to work better than if they were given an individualized assignment, all right? Are we fine with these needs? Are we fine? Because we are done with this particular theory. Are we okay? Yes, sir. Yes, bro. Yes, bro. Okay. And but, bro, <laughs> uh, people with the need of power. Yes. Okay. In case you are a manager, yeah. How will you handle them? Because even if you have grouped them, maybe a group work in a workplace, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that they are even leading a group, mm -hmm. they want to influence other groups. <laughs> <laughs> to persuade the other leaders. <laughs> but, <laughs> they are everywhere, but, seriously. They that, want to influence other uh -huh. groups, like they want to have all the group to themselves. Mm -hmm. It's like they don't allow the other leaders to function. So they'll be communicating with other mm -hmm. group members just to find out what the other leader is doing. <laughs> then they'll be passing, they'll be passing comments just to like other group members to feel like I should have been in your group before. Yeah, I feel yeah, like yeah, I should yeah, be yeah. in your group. Yeah, yeah. How yeah, will yeah, you yeah, handle yeah. such people? Oh, that one, eh, I'll be treating uh, organizational, managing organizational conflicts and politics. Okay. Even though it's not part, no, no, it's not part of your course outline because of the brevity of time. But I'll be teaching oh. and posting that particular video. Okay. Oh, I'll be teaching okay, two yeah. things. I'll be teaching managing change and also, um, yes, organization, managing organizational politics and conflicts. All right. So that may help in addressing some of these things. But <laughs> let's limit ourselves to this, what we've just explained. But I know, I know this, this things happen, right? We have people with all manner of attitudes at the workplace. But as a manager, yeah, so you can imagine if this person was not even a leader at all, okay? Yes, if it is a way that you have a superordinate goal, like one particular goal that you want them to achieve, you could make him the overall coordinator, right, of the various groups, okay? But <laughs> it's not easy. It's not easy. But yeah, from the organization like is a place that all of us should grow. If they are continually giving you a loan every day, overall coordinator, <laughs> every day, overall coordinator. So others should not have opportunity to grow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's continue. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The workplace is, is interesting, very, very interesting, mm. right? And and some some workplaces have churches and mosques at the work premises. So. But 
if they come to the workplace, the attitude and behavior, you just wonder whether it's the same people who go to those churches or mosques. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. interesting. The politics at the workplace is serious. Okay, let's move on. So we move to the next category of theory. So what we've discussed so far, I think there were four. We, we emphasize the fact that they are known as the content theories and the motivation. And the whole, their whole argument is the fact that human beings have needs. And as a manager, if you want to make the best use of people, identify the needs that they have and try and satisfy these needs. Okay, that is the content theories. And the motivation theories also, we have the second block or group of theories known as process theories. Okay, so they focus on behavior directly. And it's not as if content theories don't focus on behavior, but the main focus is first to meet the needs. And by meeting the needs, that will help you influence the behavior of your employees. That is content theory, all right? Process theory, the whole idea is to target uh, behavioral change straight away. Instead of passing through the needs that people have, you want to focus on how to immediately influence the behavioral change. And it's also known as a process because process because it passes through a process. It relies on the cognitive thinking of people. It relies on the perception of your employees. Okay, so we we'll look at we we'll look at them. For example, if you take say equity. All right, equity necessarily doesn't mean. The, the needs of employees have not been met. So, um, Regina, will you be kind enough to tell us your salary? I know you won't. How much hey, you bro. earn now? <laughs> 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 bro, bro, <laughs> bro, bro, ask me, ask me, I'll tell you. <laughs> That's why you put us on the spotlight. Okay. Right, too. <laughs> Okay, you let me revise the question. <laughs> please, please, how I much, beg. I beg. How, much, <laughs> how much will make you happy in terms of monthly salary, given your qualification and your experience? I want somebody to volunteer. So I'm not asking for your current salary. Oh, sir, for please. now. Please, I'm getting now, feedback. I'm getting feedback. Somebody is somewhere where there is noise, so there's some feedback. If you are over there, please, you can mute or change your environment. Yes, Regina. Pro, please, for now, mm -hmm. uh, maybe with my master's. Yes. At least. <laughs> mm, uh, <laughs> mm. <laughs> uh, they tell me your own salary to you, can't <laughs> Uh, we can't, so prof, we can't. Uh, it's uh, like the organization they are not fair. So let me just throw this there. <laughs> no, 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 no. If you, I'm assuming you are in a perfect organization, all right? Not even your organization. How much would you want to take as monthly salary? <laughs> Given your qualification, your experience. That's all that I want. So I'm not talking even about your current organization. Hmm. Hey, I asked you your own salary, me. you can't tell me. If you give me 6K, I would like it more. How much? 6K. 6,000. Yes. 6,000. Yes. Okay. Do we all agree? <laughs> Is that the desire of everybody in the group? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Who said no? <laughs> eh? Okay, how much do you want? Somewhere ten thousand. Ten thousand. Yes, yes. Which I want to say the same thing. <laughs> but you were afraid to say it. Oh, uh, eleven thousand uh, prop at least to, to cushion us. Ah. But you, the 10,000 information, are you getting it? 
And you now want to get to eleven thousand. So some people are in a private sector; they are getting it too. No, 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 no. You are not. You have quoted your salary. So you let's continue. <laughs> eh? I'm just using this as an example. So don't get emotional about how people are getting. Okay. <laughs> so the point I want to make is that um, so if this class, given your qualification, your experience. Everybody, I will assume, will be okay with say ten thousand, okay. But if I uh, once again, assuming you were all in the same organization with the same experience, qualification, and you were to hear that another colleague was taking fifteen thousand, how will you feel about it? <laughs> so Regina, Evelyn, and Akosia, all the names there. You are in the same company. The nature of your work, the same thing. Uh, same qualification and experiences. And then you've heard that Akusia is taking 15000 but you are being paid 10000 How will you feel about that? And how will that affect your work behavior? Yes, please, I want responses. Say, no means yes. that I'm doing the same work with someone and the person is being paid more than I am being paid. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't put in my efforts because I, it's one I would want to quit and go to where I'll get I'll be paid well. That's if right. That's not happening. Then where I am, I'm not putting in my maximum because if maximum is not giving me that amount, <laughs> the mm -hmm. average is the money that I'm getting. I'll work based on the money. I wouldn't put in so much efforts for that. Okay. Is that is that the sentiment of all of you? No, sir. Okay, what what view will you have? How will you feel about it? You see, sometimes the salary, let's mm -hmm. assume, just like you mentioned, we are all in the same company, maybe the same uh, qualification, but sometimes the job description. Mm -hmm. that will determine your no, no, I just no, I just told you job is the same, the job same. description is the same. Yeah. You're doing yeah, the well. same type of job, but somebody is paid. Your your colleague is paid fifteen thousand. You are paid ten thousand. Say at where specifically is it? Private sector or public sector? <laughs> Whatever. I want to know first. <laughs> I want to know so, first. Yes. Yeah, so the response, the first response, would be how most people react. Right? You you yeah. feel cheated, but don't forget yeah. the first question was you to determine your salary and you quoted ten thousand. What it means is that the 10,000 was something that you were okay with. If you knew all of your colleagues were being paid 10,000, you will have been fine. But as soon as you hear that somebody's even be paid 11,000, in spite of the fact that you said 10,000 was okay for you, you felt cheated, you felt disrespected, and that tends to affect your thinking your your whatever and that will also lead to a change in behavior okay so that is how the process theories work the focus is not on the needs of people it's not as if you are not being paid well that's why i started with asking you people to quote how much you want to be paid okay so it's not really based on the needs that people have it's about their thinking, cognitive thinking, their perception of how you think and, and treat them. Whether they feel a sense of respect or disrespect, they, they feel cheated. Those kind of cognitive processes tend to influence the way they behave in the organization. Okay, And that is the focus of the process theories. The content theories were about the needs of people. But process says, you may be even achieving the needs, but if you use the wrong procedure or process, you are likely to affect the perception and the thinking of employees, and that will affect their motivation or behavior at the workplace. Is the explanation clear? Is it clear? Please, I want a response. Says clear. Yes, okay. Prof. All right. So process theory, most of the time, dwells more on 
the processes, the, the thinking, cognitive thinking, the perceptions that people have and so on and so forth. So th that was the focus of this category of, of scholars that contributed to the motivation theory. So under that, we have what is known as equity theory. We have expectancy theory. We have reinforcement theory. And we have the fourth one, goal setting theory. All right, goal setting theory. So let's look at equity theory. According to the equity theory, workers compare the reward potential to the effort they must expend. So the theory says, first and foremost, people will compare the effort that they put into their work and with the reward that they get from their work. So that is the first thing that people, most workers will do. And I think, I think it was a, a question who answered some question like that, talking about reducing the effort and all that, okay? So first and foremost, you want to find out the effort that I'm making, the input that I'm making, the energy that I'm spending on this work, is it commensurate with the reward system that I'm getting from that particular work? So that is the first comparison that people make. Okay, so equity exists when workers perceive that rewards equal effort. So if they feel the amount that they are being paid or the amount that they are getting is equal to the effort that they are making in that particular job, then that leads to equity. Okay, next point says, but employees just don't look at their potential rewards they look at the rewards of others as well. So that's the second point. And that was the example we made earlier. So people don't also just look at their own effort and reward. They also then compare the effort, their effort and reward with the effort and reward of other people. So if they think the work that they are doing, the nature of the job description is similar to a colleague at the workplace then they now want to find out how much that colleague is getting compared to this. And that, that, as I said, that was the illustration that we did. And once they find inequity or any difference, no matter how much they are personally paid, it brings some feeling of, of, of uh, how do you say it? Injustice, unfairness, disrespect, and so on and so forth. And that then influence how they expend energy on their job, okay? So the first ratio is giving my effort, is the reward okay for me, all right? If they see their reward to be okay with regards to their, re their effort to, to measure up with the reward that they are getting, that is the first thing. They are okay. But being social beings, we are not just interested in our own effort and reward we tend to compare. And that is where, as a manager, you want to be careful how you manage people. So people, we spoke about social needs. They will interact, they will talk with others, their colleagues. Sometimes the person you are even paid well will go and be bragging, all right? He himself will go and boast about how much he's taking, even though they are doing similar jobs and so on and so forth. As a manager, you need to be careful because it creates a state of inequity. Okay, so inequities occur when people feel that their rewards are inferior to the rewards offered to other persons sharing the same workload. So we are not talking about situations where the workloads are different or job descriptions are different. We're talking about a situation where job descriptions are the same, workloads are the same, but person A is paid more than person B. If you do that, you create a state of inequity and as a manager or potential manager or leader you don't want to create inequity at your workplace okay because whenever inequity occur some things some changes must happen and most of the time it is not to the interest of the organization okay so i think akusia or somebody again spoke about their input their effort once there is a state of inequity, the first thing that employees may seek to do is to change their efforts 
the amount of energy or work that they do at the workplace will diminish. Okay. Maybe the first is probably to seek to improve their own reward. So they may go to management to seek their uh, attention or to seek for increase in pay and bonuses and all that. If that doesn't happen, what it will happen is that they may want to change their effort or input into the organization. And that is not in the best interest of the organization. Okay. If they are try changing the input and the inputs, they are not able to, or they are not satisfied even with the changes, reduction their effort. The next they will be thinking about is to psychologically distort their object of comparison. So what that when that happens, this is what happens. In sort of the employee looking for somebody who is being paid more than him or her, they will start now be looking at somebody that they are paid higher than. Okay. Mm, okay. So that even though I'm being cheated somewhere, if I'm comparing myself to this person, but if I was to compare myself to C, at least I'm better off than C. And that is just to psychologically console himself or herself to continue. But you don't want such an environment. Such an employee is not a happy employee. He's just trying to psychologically survive at the workplace. He's not happy. Okay? So they may change the object of comparison. If it was B that was giving them stress, they now will compare themselves with a C so that they will feel okay. Okay? Even though they still experience a sense of inequity or injustice in the organization. All right. Then the next one really is the fact that they may change the environment of inequity. That is to say that they may decide to create the organization altogether. So this organization A that is being unfair and unjust and treating me unequitably or inequitably, then probably I should just leave leave that particular organization and look for another organization. And that really comes at a cost to most organizations. Okay, the person might have acquired a lot of experience over the years, and yet because of state of inequity or injustice, the person will live with all the experience. You now have to employ a new person, train the person, and all that and all that. So as a manager, you want to avoid creating state of inequities at the workplace because that comes with consequences, okay? Any questions on equity theory? Any questions, any contributions? Are we fine? <clears throat> Okay, so since you are silent, I guess you are okay. So we move to the next one. So the lesson basically is that don't don't try to, to treat your employees unequitably. Sometimes this inequity is not just salary, right? It's about how you relate with them, how you greet others and ignore others, and so on and so forth, right? So we have to be careful as leaders or managers at the workplace that employees are comparing how you treat them. Okay. Then we have yeah. expectancy yeah. theory. So Victor Vroom, introduced the well, theory of motivation. Please, I'm getting feedback. You, If you can mute your mic, somebody's talking. Victor Vroom introduced theory of motivation. The expectancy theory says that an employee will be motivated to exert a high level of effort when he or she believes that so the expectancy theory is based on expectation. That is where the theory is coming from. Expectancy. Employees have expectations. And these are the connections, okay? So these are the expectations that they have. One, that, that their effort will lead to a good performance appraisal. So that's the first expectation. Every employee will put, is putting in his best or effort because it thinks that will lead to good performance appraisal. So whenever the person puts in like equity theory, 
his best effort and that leads to bad performance appraisal that creates some confusion and agitation in the employee okay but let's continue and see the linkage the employee is also with the expectation that if he's able to get good performance appraisal that will lead to organizational rewards okay so people work hard at the workplace first and foremost because they want to be appraised well and the appraisal well is not really what they want that is not the end goal the expectation is that the appraisal will lead to organizational rewards okay and the rewards also is not really what they want the expectation is that the organizational rewards will help them to satisfy their personal goals so if we if we take away all the processes you can directly connect effort to personal goals all right effort leads to performance good performance appraisal good performance appraisal leads to organizational rewards organizational rewards should lead to the attainment of personal goals so in real sense when people come to work the effort that they put in is connected to their personal goals and as a manager you need to know this and find a way to connect personal goals to organizational goals maybe we'll talk about that under goal setting theory okay but this then a theory helps break down the expectations of employees and how managers should handle that make sure that there is fairness when in performance appraisal all right if people are putting in their best and at the end of the day the performance appraisal is bad and a colleague who is not working that hard is getting good appraisal that straight away lead to demotivation all right and when most of us will, will uh, testify to this at the workplace because either the, you have personal issues with your supervisor your boss he doesn't just like you and so on and so forth and so your effort no matter what you do doesn't lead to good performance appraisal that can lead to demotivation that will not promote motivation at the workplace but if you were to connect effort to performance, the nature of the performance appraiser, that's the first step in getting people motivated. And here we are not just saying that give any everybody good performance appraiser. No, that is also a source of demotivation. Because don't forget, we spoke our people with a desire for excellence. They want to see themselves ahead of other people because they put in their very best. Okay, so be very honest when it comes to assessment of the effort of your subordinates or employees, say that their effort must well be well reflected in the nature of the performance appraisal. If you were to appraise everybody equally, the low performing employees will be more bold to perform poorly because they know that no matter how they perform, they will still get good performance appraisal. If you were to appraise Hard working employees poorly, then straight away they will behave like the other employees because they know that no matter how hard they work, their performance appraisal will be poor. Okay, so we need to know these connections as managers. The next important connection is that the performance appraisal results should be the basis for organizational promotion and rewards decisions. Once again, some of us will have experienced this, right? You receive all the praises and you had very good performance appraisal, but when there was an opportunity to travel outside, it was someone else that didn't get those good performance appraisal that, that was selected. And here mm -hmm. I'm not talking about... <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't cry you i beg you <laughs> i'm just using it for my teaching all right so so you see the disconnect between the performance appraisal results and the rewards and and promotional opportunities at the workplace if you do that human beings are rational good performance appraisal where are they sending it if it won't lead to any form of reward in the organization okay so as managers or leaders the other important thing is that basis for promotion and and any other goodies at the workplace must be related to performance appraisal reports 
so that people will know that the performance appraisal and performance assessment is not something that is just done out of fun. And that if you were to work hard, it can lead to some rewards or some awards in the organization. Okay. Then the next point is that the rewards that you want to give the employee should be something that is, um, I don't know how to put it, but it should be something that the employees or workers will cherish and value as something of value to them. Okay. If there's, if there's not anything worthwhile, then the entire process is defeated. Okay. Why should I work hard to get good performance appraisal? And after getting performance appraisal, they will give you uh, rewards, rewards that you feel is just like dealing with, with white, right? And this is basically a cultural issue. You know, they like issues of cards. Uh, what do you call it? Oh, how do they call toughest craft? They have some word that they use for toughest. Uh, so they like very, very simple things. If you provide a card for them, a frame, a souvenir, <laughs> some basic stuff. You said? <laughs> no, 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 no. Lisa, can you please? Please, who just said me? Oh, 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 um, okay, sorry. Where were we? Um, yes, yeah, so I was talking about the whites and the things that they tend to value compared to S, right? So a letter, a card of appreciation is something that is so valuable to them. Yes, but if you come to the context of developing country, we want something far more tangible, right? And, and somebody didn't even understand why salary should be under hygiene factors, okay? Mm -hmm. So if you're giving the rewards, the reward should be something that your employees will cherish, something that they feel will help them to meet their personal goals. Okay, so these are the connections that we have to make. Whenever there is a disconnect in any of this relationship, it can lead to demotivation at the workplace. Okay, so that is the whole idea of expectancy theory. Employees have expectations, and as managers or leaders, if we fail to meet these expectations in terms of these three relationships, then we create a very dangerous ground for them to be demotivated at the workplace. Okay. Any any questions? Is it clear? Yes. Is yes, the theory bro. clear? Yes, bro. Okay. All right. Let's move on to the next theory. So this is also known as reinforcement theory. It has its place largely in education. Education people use it a lot, but it's a general theory that can be applied. Normally, they use it in classroom management. All right. If you're dealing with kids and so on and so forth, how do you use this particular theory to motivate employee, uh, students to behave well? Okay. But as we might see, it's also applicable at the workplace. So the reinforcement theory based on E.L. Tondek's law of effect simply looks at the relation between behavior and its consequences. All right. So it includes the following techniques. One, they have what is known as, uh, it talks about positive reinforcement. And positive reinforcement calls for rewarding desirable behavior. So if somebody is behaving the way that you want at the workplace, then you can find a way to reward that particular behavior. Okay? It might be word of acknowledgement. It might be, you know, some organizations, they have monthly or weekly meetings where they recognize employees. Now they even have some frame, best worker of the month, whatever it is. Okay, so that's the first way to motivate. 
you can use positive reinforcement. And reinforcement basically means you want the person to repeat that particular type of behavior. All right. So if somebody is doing a, putting up a behavior that is desirable and that is what you want as a manager, you need to reinforce that behavior by rewarding that particular type of behavior. Okay. Point two, we have what is known as avoidance. So avoidance is an attempt to show an employee what the consequences of improper behavior will be. If an employee does not engage in, in that improper behavior, he or she will not experience the consequence. Okay, so with avoidance, you want to show employees the consequences or the punishment that will come if they put up a particular type of behavior. Okay, so yes, like company policies, there were issues like lateness to work. Maybe the manager will, will hold a meeting and, and make you aware that if you were to come to work uh, late for the first time, you may be given, uh, you may have an oral reprehension or something of that sort. The second time you'll be given a written warning. The third time you may be suspended. And the last one, you will be dismissed. What it means is that the whole year or whatever, you cannot be late four times within a year or whatever in the organization, okay? So at the point of avoidance, what you're seeking to do is to project the consequences of undesirable behavior. The person has not actually put up that behavior, but you want to prevent the person from behaving that way by showing the person the consequences of that particular behavior. Is that point clear? Okay, so in the classroom setting, before the class starts or whatever it is, you tell the the this thing, names of talkatives. And I know Regina, you've you've been punished several times for talking. All right, so you could have, and you make everybody in the class aware that if your name was written for talking. All right. I, I remember that we used to even have a list for vernacular, isn't it? <laughs> for speaking vernacular. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so. <laughs> if, if your name, I'm the one who has been writing their name, so. <laughs> ah, because they know you are a talkative. Huh? Or you have the need, the need no. for control. <laughs> need for control. Eh? <laughs> so, those of us who went to Saito. Yes, yeah, Saito. Our it's names were written so many times for vernacular. Vernacular. Eh? Yes. So <laughs> the, the teacher will let you know the consequences for speaking vernacular or uh, for talking in class. All right. At that point, it is known as avoidance. They want to prevent you from either talking or uh, speaking in vernacular. Okay, so at that stage is avoidance. So it can be used in classroom management. It can as well be used at the workplace in order to prevent employees from behaving the way that you, the manager or leader, you won't want them to behave. Okay, so that is what is known as avoidance. Then we have extension. Extension is ignoring the behavior of a subordinate and not providing either positive or negative reinforcement. All right. So, you know, in the classroom, some students misbehave because they just want attention. And it is so at, at workplaces as, as well. OK, there are people that they just want everybody to know that they, they have arrived. All right. So they will either say something, make some comment just for people to know that they are, they are there. And as a manager, you have to be very tactical in knowing what to respond to and what to ignore. Okay, there are bet people that are better managed by not responding to their stimuli or the things that they do. Okay, so they want to bring some confusion and whether you respond positively or negatively, that can create a problem for you as the leader or the manager of your organization. So the best thing is to ignore such people and with time, whatever confusion they wanted to create will just die naturally. Okay. But if you want to speak about it in whatever direction, it can escalate that particular problem that they want to bring to that particular organization. Okay, so that technique is what is known as extension. 
And then, as I said, it is used in the classroom as well. So there are students that you can almost every day, but they will still come and behave worse than they did the previous time. Why? Because even the caning and the cheering and the fans that they receive from their colleague, it's a form of negative motivation for them. I told you motivation could be positive or negative. Okay. So if you're a teacher with experience, the best thing is that when that student is misbehaving that way, you just ignore the person. And with time, that person will stop that particular type of behavior. Okay, so it's applicable at the workplace, as I said, as well. We just have troublemakers at the workplace. And if you want to respond to everything that they say, they will destroy your organization for you. Okay, mm -hmm. so as a wise leader or manager, you don't have to respond to everything or anybody. If you get to know that these people are just problem makers or trouble causers, so to speak, don't, don't mind them. All right. With time, they will get tired and, and leave you alone for you to enjoy your peace. But if you want to respond to everything, everything you want to fight, they will destroy your leadership for you. So that technique is under reinforcement theory and it's known as extinction. Just assume they don't exist. Extinct them. Ignore them. Okay. Mm. Then we have the fourth one. The fourth one is known as punishment. So the first, fourth one is very related to point two, avoidance, okay? So it's an attempt to decrease the likelihood of a behavior re recurring by applying negative consequences. At the avoidance stage, you don't apply the consequences. <laughs> you use the consequences to threaten them not to put up the behavior. But at the punishment stage, you actually apply the consequences in order to prevent the behavior. What it means is that at the punishment stage, the person has actually done what you wanted to prevent at the avoidance stage. Okay? Mm -hmm. So he said when you come to school or class, don't, don't talk. Names, your name will be written. You'll be asked to fetch uh, five buckets of water. And I remember we used to even go and cut sticks, right? For garden, <laughs> the garden yes. of our teacher and something like of those things. Huh? Very, very painful, painful punishment. When your friends are playing <laughs> football, you're in the bush <laughs> looking for... <laughs> Were they called garden sticks or something? I forgot. <laughs> uh, looking yeah, for garden, so garden like sticks, that. something like that. Okay? Yeah. So... <laughs> So the avoidance stage is when you tell them they will fetch five buckets of water or they will bring this number of garden sticks and so on and so forth, just to prevent them from doing that. But at the end of the day, some will still do that. When they do that, then you move to the stage of punishment where you actually apply the consequences that they were warned of at the avoidance stage. So once the consequence, and here you're applying the consequences in order to prevent that behavior from recurring in the future. Once you apply the consequences, you're now dealing with a technique known as punishment. Are we fine with the explanations? Yeah. Are we okay with the explanations? Yes. Okay, who volunteered to run them, run through them for us before we proceed to the next one? If we were having face-to-face, -face, that, that's what I do. That's how I teach you. And I won't ask for volunteer. I'll just point at you, your face now to say. Millicent, we've not heard Talk from you today. I try. No, let, let's try, Millicent. If she's not talking, then I'll come to you. Millicent, are you in the class? Yes, I'm in the class. Okay. I have a bad network. My network is very bad. Okay, then Regina, you can Hello. pick it up. Yes, that's fine. Millicent, yeah, I, I can see that. So it's okay. Let Regina go through that for us. First, the positive uh, reinforcement mm -hmm. that we talk about is about uh, you uh, 
giving a uh, appropriate reward to whoever that uh, go according to what they supposed to do. Right. Then I've read that like uh, maybe giving gifts or acknowledging the person, giving cards and those things. That one you said it depends on our culture. You see why it's when you give them cards or a free data of acknowledgement, it means a lot to them. But maybe when it comes to us, maybe they say the best performance employee of the year and those things, it helps the people, it motivates them to work and show their best uh, behavior. Then with the avoidance, you trying to let the employee know the consequences of what the person is about to do. Maybe to say that if you are late for work, this is what will happen to you. Maybe verbal warning, then maybe you come to written. You, you let the person know what you are coming to do. This is the cause before it even happened. That's right. Then when you come to extension, it's like you are just ignoring or you know that this person, I don't have to uh, reply or react to anything that the person is doing. Let me say, for example, our children, uh, maybe you know this particular child, you are trying everything for him or her to behave well. But you could see that the same behavior is reoccurring, even upgrading to different level. So the best is to just pretend as whatever the person is doing, you, you, you didn't see. Then the person will realize when you come to the workplace too, some people, they intentionally got late so that they'll provoke you to say something that they'll say you are not good. That's right. Or to influence others. So your best thing you have to do is just distance yourself from them. Pretend mm -hmm. as if when they come to work, fine. When they don't come, fine. You just see them like that and concentrate on other things. Otherwise, they'll frustrate you. At the end of the day, you will not achieve whatever that you want. And at the end of the day, they'll paint you as if you are the uh, maybe hard boss on That's them. Right. That's right. Then in terms of a uh, punishment, uh, for you, <laughs> this place, you are, you are saying something about, is it positive or negative? I'm sorry to you. Yeah. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you're talking about saying negative something. So in terms of the perfect, like this one there, it's like you have, uh, ignore the person you have avoided the person I don't know how to <laughs> read it but so you have to punish I the said person. it's related this yes so it's related to <laughs> the avoidance yeah. the avoidance is where you <laughs> yes. show the consequences but oh, the sure. punishment is where you actually <laughs> apply the consequences okay, okay. so okay. with the avoidance you tell them yeah. if you do this this is what will happen this is that will happen we hoping that by showing them the consequence, they won't behave that way. But when they finally behave that way, okay. make sure you apply the punishment. All right. So that is the question. Sure, sure. Okay. So I oh, hope okay. it's clear. Now. I hope I tried. Yes, you did your best. It was good. Okay. So let's move to. Hello, the next bro. One. Yes, please. Please, uh, I would like to ask a question about the extension. Yes, please. I've just I've just been wondering, assuming you have an employee mm -hmm. in an organization who causes trouble, he, the person is noted for such a behavior. Mm -hmm. You've tried your possible best to help the person to stop and all that. Yeah. But the person is it, like is within. That is his character. That's mm -hmm. his nature. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, that attitude is pushing clients or customers away. Yeah. How, how do you do? Will you just extend the person? Will you just say, oh, let's ignore him. With time, he will change. Because I, I have seen a similar situation before. And this thing is pushing the clients and customers away. No, no, no. So, so, so if you're, yeah, if you're in the position to fire such an employee, don't hesitate. You can fire the person. It's part of the punishment. So basically, so we're talking about there are situations, especially in the public sector, okay, normally where mm -hmm. you cannot fire the person. 
It's a yes. government worker just as you. So you just have to try yeah. and manage. That is where the extension normally will play. But if it's a private organization, you you won't even there. They'll fire you. All right. So, I'm just wondering a government institution where the person even knows that well, after all, you are not the one who employed me. You exactly. cannot even fire me. Exactly. So that's the difficulty. So in that context, your best is to just extend because sometimes those who behave that way even tend to have powerful people in the organization. Okay. Such like that if you want to do something, they'll go and report to you and all that. You know, public sector, all the nonsense that goes on there. Okay. So. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. in a situation where the person does not necessarily push clients away, but his attitude is causing a problem to his colleagues. For yeah. instance, the person is a drunkard mm -hmm. and he drinks and comes to the office. Mm -hmm. He causes health problems to other colleagues. <laughs> will, you, <laughs> will you say that? Will you just leave the person like that? Because the sense that is even coming from the person alone is causing things to other people. How do you deal with that? I've, I've just been thinking Oh, but then you it. have so many tools. You have punishment, right? So for such a person, you can ask the security people not to let the person in. It's as simple as that. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you let him mm -hmm. know that if he comes to work drunk, he will not come. You will not allow him to come. Then you inform the security. That's it. Okay, so in all of these tools, we need to know when, and that one we have to use our personal judgment and, and common sense in reasoning up. Yeah. Okay, at what point should I be? Bro, this I want to laugh more, though. Is it? Bro, I, I just want to laugh about a drunk as a drunkard when you say she didn't come in. Next time, you will not come at all. <laughs> 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 It's an opportunity for him not to come again. Uh, yes. yes. So all, all this discussion will happen because probably we're talking about the public sector. In the private sector, yes. you won't dare behave that way in the first place, right? Yeah. So you won't dare. You won't dare come into work drunk. Yes. So all of this is because of the nature of our public sector. Okay. Uh, I think this is fine. Let's go to goal setting theory. As the name suggests, the goal setting theory was introduced by Edwin Locke, proposed that intentions to work hard toward a goal are a major source of work mo motivation. In general, the more difficult the goal, the higher the level of performance expected. So if people contribute in setting up or developing a goal or setting a goal, what it means is that they are likely to be more motivated because then they have the intention to work towards that particular goal. Okay, so it's coming from goal setting. And in our personal life, we, we know that, okay, the, the, if, we, if you just walk around or work around with a goal, the way you work is different from somebody that has a goal. Okay, I can just say in this course, the way you, you pay attention and read and do all manner of things probably is based on the, the grade that you want to get. Okay, for those who want to get an A, it, it will determine how you learn, how you, you volunteer to do certain things. For those who just want to pass, that will also influence your behavior towards this particular course. So goals are very, very important motivating factors that can influence people to work out towards a particular uh, attainment of that particular goal. Okay, four factors influence the goals performance relationship. One, employee must be committed to the goal. So this is where employee participation or subordinates participation in setting goal is very, very important. As the manager or leader, don't just go and set your goal at your office and come and communicate to them. If you do that, you will not build commitment towards that particular goal. In fact, the best way is to get the target or the goal coming from your subordinates or employee. If this at a level that you also think is reasonable, then you can achieve point one or condition one. Okay, there is a higher chance that they'll be committed towards the attainment of that goal. 
Point two, the employee must believe that he can perform the tax. So that some tax must be performed to be able to achieve the goal. The employees must have this uh, self-efficacy that they are capable of performing that particular tax. What it means is that if the tax is out of their range, rich in terms of their experience, qualification, training, then even though the goal might be very good goal, they will still not be able to achieve it because they don't have what it takes to be able to achieve that particular goal. Okay, so first, the goal must be coming from them, but you need to be sure that the goal that you are setting, your employees have the competences and the knowledge and the abilities and the experience to be able to work towards the attainment of that particular goal, okay? The tasks that they have to do are things that they can easily do or not easily do, even though challenging, but they should be able to do that task to be able to achieve the goal that you've set for yourself. Point three, the tax involved in achieving the goal should be simple, familiar, and independent, all right? So simple doesn't mean easy here. What it means is that there should be clear clarity as to what they are supposed to be doing, all right? They should know what they should do in order to be able to achieve that, that particular goal. So the task should be simple, they should understand what they are supposed to be doing. It should be familiar. Back to point two, they should have the experience, they should have the knowledge, and so on and so forth, as far as that tax is concerned, okay? Then it should be independent. What it means is that their ability to perform the tax should not be based on something else. For example, if they, they have what it takes to do the tax, but then they needed some resources and these resources depended on another person who fails to provide that resource. Then even though they have what it takes to do their work, they will not be able to do their work because they, they don't have the independent, uh, whatever, environment to be able to do that particular tax. I don't know whether this explanation is clear. Okay. So first, goal setting, your goal is a powerful motivating tool. And the way for it, the conditions for it to achieve, for you to achieve the motivational uh, attribute of a goal at the workplace is to make sure that your employees are committed to the goal. Okay. And I said the way to do that is to allow for participation in goal setting. Then the next point is that the employees must believe they can perform the tax that will lead to the attainment of the goal. Okay. So you can set any goal. This is about the internal environment as well, if you remember our earlier explanations. If the goal that you've set is not based on your strengths and weaknesses, what it means is that the goal will not be motivating enough because you know within you that you don't have what it takes in terms of your strength to be able to achieve that particular goal. Okay, so the employee must feel that I can do what it takes to be able to achieve the goal that I've set for myself. So if you want an A in this course, and you know by your nature of your work, you can't stay there during the day, at night you are sleeping, uh, lectures you will not attend, uh, what the audio you won't listen to, and you want to get an A, then you want to get Malam A or something like of that sort, okay? Because you don't believe you can do the tax or you'll not be able to do the tax that will give you the goal that you've set for yourself. All right. Then the tax also, the learning that you have to do in our context should be simple. Simple, as I said, doesn't mean easy, but you should know clearly the things that you should be learning in this course or program to be able to get your A. There should be clarity of the topics. Uh, there should be course outline and, and questions shouldn't be coming outside of the course outline. So we'll come to the the next point, which is familiar, okay? You know what you are supposed to do in order to get an A in this course or to be able to achieve the goal that you've set for yourself. Then the independent means that your getting of the A should be based on how well you learn, okay? And not because of whether the lecturer likes you or doesn't like you. So if the A is based on how much the lecturer likes you, what it means is that getting an A is not independent. It is rather dependent on the kind of 
uh, favor that you may have before your lecturer. In which case, really, you the, the attainment of the goal is not in your hands because someone else can determine whether you can do what it takes to be able to get it or not, okay? So that is point three. The tax should be simple, it should be familiar, and it should also be independent. It should be within your own power and abilities. You choosing to do it or not to do it should be what, that, what will determine whether you are able to achieve that goal or not, and not somebody's wish and, and caprices. Okay, then the last point we have to know is that the goal setting theory is culture bound. Okay, so earlier on when I was talking about giving some example, I told you that when it comes to even reward systems and those things, the whites tend to value certain things that we don't value, okay, in, in our part of the world. And I was talking about cats and stuff like that. So it's the same thing with goal setting theory. Different cultures, cultures have their definition of what success means to them, all right? So if you don't set goals that are relevant to the culture within which you are operating, that can actually cause you not to be able to achieve that particular goal. So we have some culture that value individualistic achievements, okay? And we have some cultures that value, say, team or group achievements, that should determine the type of goals that you should be setting at your workplace. If you find yourself in an environment where they boast of group attainment of goals, you don't go there and set individual goals and targets. All right. If you do that, you'll not be able to achieve them. The reverse is also true. If you operate in a culture where they believe in individual achievements, and you're thinking about setting group goals or goals that people have to work together to achieve, you are not likely to achieve those goals because you didn't take into cognizance the culture of the society or the environment within which you are operating, all right? So what is important or what should be the goal in the first place is subject to cultural interpretation, okay, right? Some culture value certain things. Uh, materialistic culture, they value so much material. Others are not, okay? As I said, the whites, if you give them card or frame or write up, they are so, so, so happy about that. In our contest, we want money, right? Huge, huge money. Not, not cats, not toughies, all right? We want oh. something. Oh. Uh, poverty has damaged us so much. <laughs> if it's not tangible and, and money, the, the people will not get motivated about that. So they go certain theory is culturally bound. It depends on the culture where you are operating. That should determine the goal that you should be setting and trying to help your employees achieve. Okay, are we fine with goal setting theory? So it's very, very simple. It says that goals are important motivational tools that managers or leaders can use at the workplace. But there are conditions that need to be obeyed or followed and other for that particular role of goals to be activated, okay? And those are the four things that we just discussed. So you can try it at the personal level, all right? Your attitude whenever you have a goal to meet is always different when, than when you leave things to chance, okay? So you can try it for everything that you're doing. And for the fact that you have enrolled onto this program means that you're an ambitious person, right? You have goals. So after this, you also have to set another goal. After this number of years, I want to be that. It may not be formal education, but any other area of your life. And you'll be surprised how you'll be motivated to achieve that. Okay. So yeah. that brings us to the end of the theories. So we have, we had uh, two broad types. We had the content theories and we had the process theories. We said all the content theories were talking about the fact that people or human beings have needs. And if we can identify these needs and address them, we can help serve or motivate our employees better. Process theories says that they, they, they indicated that how we went about serving or addressing these needs is very, very important because people think 
people can feel and sense things around them. Okay, so they, they have perceptions, they have cognitive abilities to interpret their environment. So the process we go about motivating is as important as the needs that we're seeking to, to serve. Okay, so motivation strategies are the specific things, if we will put it that way, that as a manager, you can put in place in order to motivate your work workers or employees. So we have four major types. We have empowering employees, so employee empowerment. We have to provide an effective reward system. So in our context, as Regina will laugh, if you don't, if you put salary, or oh, who was laughing? And the hygiene factors. So providing an effective reward system is an important motivation strategy. Then redesigning jobs. It's also important. Then the fourth strategy is creating flexibility in the jobs that people do as one of the motivational strategies. Okay, so you can motivate employees through empowerment. Empowerment occurs when individuals in an organization are given autonomy, basically authority, autonomy, authority, trust, and encouragement to accomplish a task. So you don't have to continually be under instruction of somebody to be directing you and so on and so forth. That is empowerment. To empower and to change some of the old bureaucratic ideas, managers are promoting corporate entrepreneurship. Okay, so that concept is where employees are encouraged to come up with new ideas, even though they are still in an organization. So we know entrepreneurship is all about finding ideas and then creating your own organization or company in order to serve the needs of people and so on and so forth. But now, uh, excellent managers or leaders are trying to encourage this entrepreneurial spirit. But this time around, not for you to leave the organization, but you can still be in an organization or company and yet suggest new ideas and, and, and help that existing organization to expand and grow and do well and that is what is known as corporate intrapreneurship okay and if you allow that as a manager it is one way by which you can empower your employees and motivate them to work hard in an organization then strategy two is providing an effective reward system so a reward is a work outcome of positive value to the individual. People receive rewards in one of the following two ways. So the rewards could be extrinsic rewards. They are externally administered. They are valued outcomes given to someone by another person, typically a supervisor or a higher level manager. All right. So we know these things. All the stuff that they can give to you, company cars, salaries, uh, office space, parking lot, all those things are extrinsic rewards that uh, employees value. Then we have intrinsic reward. They are self-administered. Okay, so think of a natural high a person may experience after completing, completing a job. That person feels good because she has a feeling of competencies, personal development, and self-control over her work. So as a manager, find a way to reward people both extrinsically and also intrinsically. Intrinsic rewards normally, as we've discussed earlier, in the higher levels of meeting the needs of people, normally it's come, it comes from the nature of the job itself and how the work is, is designed. If people accomplish or finish very challenging tasks, they feel that they are competent, they feel a sense of personal development, and they feel they have a lot of self-control over the work that they do. Okay. Then you can use job design or redesign of jobs as a way to motivate, as a strategy for motivation. So the first one is job enlargement, often referred to a horizontal job loading or job Job enlargement increases the variety of tax of variety of tax a job includes. So with job enlargement, as the name suggests, you're simply expanding the job horizontally. 
what it means is that the person is not given higher authority, but the person is given more responsibility or tax rather at the same level. Okay, and, and you'll be surprised why that will be a motivational strategy. Okay. Why is it that when somebody is given, okay, let, let you guys should come in and explain that. How can job enlargement be a motivational strategy? How can you increase the workload of somebody and, and call that a motivational strategy? Under what circumstance will a person get motivated with that? Anybody to help me out? Felicia, are you with us? Regina, are you there? Hello. Hello. We are there. Hey. Mm -hmm. yeah. I nearly yeah. got scared. I thought you for for. <laughs> Hello, bro. Please, can you carry the question? I said, how can job job enlargement? How can it be a motivational strategy? Because the idea is of job enlargement is to increase the workload without any increase in authority. All right, of the person, it's just the number of works that the person is doing that is increased. So, how can it be said to be? a motivational tool so because human beings are naturally okay. lazy and we don't want to work yes <laughs> yes but please with the job enlargement mm -hmm. let me come maybe you under a boss yes a certain works your boss can never give it to you unless he realize that you can do certain tasks okay so when he has assigned you with another job mm -hmm. it means that with with me it means it's an, a, a, like a form of promotion Okay. It means you have proved yourself worthy that you can do this. So you'll be That's happy right. that, oh, my boss have assigned even his work to me to mm -hmm. do. Beautiful. Maybe but, it doesn't count with another pay or something, but I right. think it's good. That's right. But what you just explained rather fall under job enrichment, right? That is, we'll explain that under job enrichment, where the job now gives you additional responsibility and somehow you feel a sense of authority because you are now doing your job's work, your boss's work, okay? But we're talking about scenario one, job enlargement, where it is just, it's not like a higher type of job. It's at the same level, but you are now required to do so many other things. And that can be a source of motivation. How? Uh, probably let me try here. Yes. Uh, just like the way we are feathering this course. Mm -hmm. If you feather your course and go back to the office mm -hmm. and they give you additional work, mm -hmm. it means they're giving you the opportunity to learn from what you have studied. Huh. Uh, I think that will be motivation. Yeah, but from this explanation also, it's more of enrichment where they now want to give you, because of your qualification, they want to give you a more enhanced work. So to speak, yeah. or even okay. though it doesn't come with additional pay, but that is job enrichment. Okay. okay. Have you mm -hmm. observed that in some and most banks, the security guys there, apart from the opening of doors, also mm -hmm. go to assist people to fill forms? Yes. Okay. They will come and teach you, oh, do that, do that when you are filling the form. Yes, yeah. but their main job was to stay there and and watch people and guard the place. Okay, but yeah. what what yeah. really and how do you think they feel about that? Is it they a source of motivate? They feel happy. Why? They feel autonomous. Like they feel some sense of authority. I don't know. I'm okay. Just trying. Okay, that's yes. right. But the, I want to take it from the point of boredom right? Job boredom, okay. where you okay. continually do the same thing over and over again. You get bored with time. Yeah, right? yeah. Yes. So when you are given additional work to do, something different from what mm -hmm. you have been doing, okay. that becomes a source of motivation. Okay? okay? It doesn't mean you've been promoted. It doesn't mean the work is any high job. 
No. But the fact that you have now been given more things to do, you feel a bit more responsible than what you used to do. I gave okay. you the example of jobs that where you'll be required to set just close or seal envelopes and write addresses. Mm. Uh, and that is all that you do to get paid at the end of the month. All right. Even though you may yeah. be happy because you are, you are being paid, with time you get bored with that job. You went to yeah. university or wherever just to be sealing envelopes, <laughs> envelopes. writing addresses. <laughs> and that is the reason why your mother gave birth to you. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, so Bro, I, I like the part that he said you went to invest to just to come back and see him. Yes, 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 yes. JHS, after JHS, you should be able to see, or even primary school, you should be able to seal envelopes and write address. Okay. So, for such a person, if they were to provide additional workload, all right, it would be a source of motivation. If even the work is still at the same level, it doesn't come with an additional pay and so on and so forth. So that is the context where job enlargement can be a source of motivation. Okay. Or even as we're talking with job, uh, your supervisor giving you workload and so on and so forth. Sometimes it's not his work, but the fact that he's, you are the one being taxed gives you a sense of pride, right? You are you are many in the office, and always when he wants to get something done, you are the one that he asks to do that particular job. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. it's a source of motivation yeah. in, in sometimes. Yeah. Okay. If you don't interpret it as punishment, then it becomes a source of motivation. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but if you see it as this way of punishment. punishing you, <laughs> then, it becomes, <laughs> then it becomes something different altogether. Okay. <laughs> yes. Then we'll move to but point hey, two. Bro, yep. remember, remember you said motivation can be negative and yes, positive. Yes, not yes, exactly. always positive. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh -huh. So it is so, when we see it as punishment, that's the negative aspect. Motivation, eh? exactly. <laughs> uh, it could okay. be still be motivation but negative. All right. But negative. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Then we we'll move to point two. I'm I'm sure you are familiar with this also. Job rotation. Okay, the, this practice assign people to different jobs or tax to different people temporary, temporarily. Hey, <laughs> so it's basically mm -hmm. rotating, moving from one job to the other. So the explanation is very similar to job enlargement, right? Where you boredom, you learn new things by going from one place to the other. You get to understand the entire organization better because you have been doing several things within the organization and so on and so forth. So job rotation can also be used as a form of motivation or strategy of motivation in an organization. In most organizations, the reward systems are not equally distributed. Okay. So in UCC, we have um, department units, or if you want schools that are say income generating based on the nature of that particular division. Okay. And most times the administrators lobby and all do all manner of things to get transferred to that particular place. So mm. if you keep people at that place forever permanently, you are actually disadvantaging other employees okay. in the university. Okay. So with time, no matter who you are, once it's an administrative role, you'll be transferred and then some other people brought in. But really, the time that people spend also depends upon how strong they are. And you know what I mean by strong. Okay. So mm. that is that. So job rotation, when people get to those places, they are very, very like, excited, not just because of the work, but also the monetary rewards that come from that place. And I'm sure most organizations are like that. The reward systems, even the nature of the works are not the same across board. So as you rotate employees, it can also be a source of motivation, all right? Then point three, we have job enrichment. That is what the earlier contributors were trying to talk about, all right? You have enriched the work. You bring more autonomy and more responsibility to the work. So also called vertical job loading. This application includes not only increased variety of tasks, 
but also provides an employee with more responsibility and what authority. Okay. Yes. Most of the time it may look like promotion. Yes, promotion is one way, but where you are itself, your job can be enriched. And that is the examples or the explanations you people provided much earlier. So after this program, if your boss was to give something that he used to do or she used to do to you to do, then you feel that your job has been enriched. Or if you always had to go and report to him or her on your way, you are doing a particular job. And at this time, he tells you, oh, based on so-so and so qualifications that you have and the way you've been working, from this point on, you can make those decisions without coming to me. That is an example of job enrichment, okay? The person has enriched your authority and your autonomy over the work. So you've not been promoted, even though promotion will help also to enrich your job, but you can still be doing the same thing. But you've been given additional responsibility and autonomy, decision-making rights, so to speak, to be able to execute that particular job, okay? And that is what is known as job enrichment. I hope it is clear. Is that clear? Yes, yes. Right. So I think we'll deal with the last one and then we'll call it a day. Um, so you can also create flexibility, creating flexibility. Flexi time permits employees to set and control their work hours. It's one way that organizations are accommodating their employees' needs. So some options are, so we, flexi time basically is where you allow employee to be able to control their work hours. Okay, I think we are supposed to work eight hours per day, isn't it? Is that the standard time? Yes. Eight hours? Yes, bro. Yes, bro. Starting from what time to what time? Eight to five. Eight a.m. to five p.m. Five p.m., yes. Five p.m. What this means is that you can also start at 9 a.m. and end at 6 (laughs) p.m. Why <laughs> laughing? Uh, why laughing? Am I lying? No, 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 no. It, it will still be eight hours, isn't it? The security would have been sucking you by five thirty. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, especially if you work, if you work in the bank. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, by, I mean, by five thirty, you should be closing up and vacating your post. Right, right. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so so we'll get there, we'll get there. So the idea I want to create is that if if the nature of your organization allows that, okay, why why would you want to insist that people come to work at eight a.m. and close at five p.m. when they can come at eleven a.m. and close at eight p.m. If some employees feel that that is the ideal time they can work. Okay, so that's the idea of flexi time. I'm not saying that is what is happening, but flexi time is where employees have the opportunity to be able to design their work hours the way they feel okay with it. All right, some may choose to do the first four hours in the morning and do the next four hours at night. And this also depends on the type of work and industry. Okay, it, may, it is not applicable to all organizations. As you rightly said, with banks, there are times that you have to come in and clients or customers will have to come to the bank and so on and so forth. Okay, so it's not applicable. But we have all these tech companies, technology-oriented companies, that you don't even have to be at the workplace to work in the first place. Okay, yeah. and organize, some organizations allow for such flexibilities. So instead of insisting that everybody reports to work at 8 a.m. and close at 5 p.m., why won't you give this range where somebody can even come at 11 a.m. and close at 8 p.m. or any of those combinations, okay? So that is the context of flexi time as part of the motivation strategies that managers must now become accustomed with, okay? So we have point one under that. We have what is known as a compressed work week. So it's a form of flexi time that allows a full-time job to be completed in less than 
the standard 40 hour five day work week okay so mm -hmm. if you we said you have to do eight hours per day and eight hours and five days in a week isn't it yeah eight times five will give us what 40 40 hours okay yes, so um 10 10 times 4 will be what what is 10 times 10 hours times 4 days will be what hey you didn't do much <laughs> sir we yeah. have to hear you oh we sorry i mean i, I said hear 10, you, sir. 10 hours times 4 is 44 40. 40. 40. okay 40 yes. hours so what it means is that the the person who did, somebody can choose to work four days in a week and still work 10 hours per day to get the same 40 hours so for that person the person can choose to come to work from monday to thursday and friday will be part of the weekends for the person what you need as a manager is for the person to work 40 hours per day. Okay, so that's the idea of compressed work week. In the most absurd form, if you have somebody who can work 20 hours per day, can, can we get 20 hours a day? <laughs> that, that'll eat it. <laughs> that'll eat it for two days. <laughs> two days. <laughs> okay, so let's stay, stay with uh, 10 hours, okay? So it's sort of... <laughs> The standard five days, eight hours. Some people can opt to work for four days. Some may choose to start their work day from, say, uh, Tuesday, Tuesday to Friday. Others may say Monday to Thursday. Okay, and any of those combinations that will give you your 40 hours. All right. What is important for you as a manager is your 40 hours per week. How the person will manage to be able to clock the 40 hours shouldn't be your concern, okay? And these things, and these options or motivational strategies, as I said much earlier, it's not applicable to all industries in the first place. Secondly, it's not something available to all type of employees. We are talking in the context of highly skilled employees. There are some of them you need their certificate to be able to open your, your company or organization in the first place. And there are people that if you don't agree with them, in fact, there are cases where some people today only go to work at once a week. It is not as if they are part-time or so. They take full-time monthly salary, and yet they can only be available in a company one day in a week. And yet the company is prepared to employ them. Why? Because they are highly skilled people. Say that mm -hmm. if you won't agree, they will, they will just leave. In fact, it's not as if they are unemployed. They are actually overemployed. So they are in UK uh, Wednesday to say Thursday. Uh, the next day they are in China doing something. Probably it's only the weekend and say or they say, okay, I'm available on Monday. From Monday, 5 p.m., I have to take my next flight to the UK because Tuesday I have to do this <laughs> and that. Right? <laughs> and because of their skill sets, you need to be flexible. That is the flexi time, okay, to accommodate or to accept this, this type of people. I hope you are getting the point we are making. So it's not mm. applicable to everybody. It's not applicable to every industry. But these are the new motivational strategies to retain highly qualified and competent employees, okay? So if they come and propose to you that I can only be available four days, yeah, and, and you still need your 10 hours. As a manager, you shouldn't be showing your, your powers. The important thing, if you think the person is highly qualified, is to make sure that he actually works the 10 hours for the four days that he is proposing, okay? That's the compressed work week. Then we have job sharing or twinning. It occurs when one full-time job is split between two or more persons. Okay, so this also is, is, is not like it's a shift tool. Even though shifting <laughs> system can also be applicable here. But 
sometimes you have a very competent, say, medical doctor. And as I said, he can only be available at a certain time of the day. So even though you have this guy, you need to employ another doctor that will deal with the routine things until that specialist is available to do the complicated assignments. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing that if you had a very qualified uh, doctor, that doctor should have been there to do all of the things. But he says, I can't be available. I will be only be available at your hospital from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. or something of that sort. So you need to do job sharing where you have two people for that particular position. Okay. There's, there's a similar explanation could go for the shift system, the normal things that we know. Somebody comes in the morning, other comes in the evening. But those that we have to deal with in this context mostly are very competent, qualified, highly skilled people that they can be available full time in your organization. They can only spare some time for you. And so you have to employ two people for the same type of job and split it for these guys. Most of the time, not proportionately. Okay. If this proportionate then we're talking more of the shift system and as i said the yeah. shift shift system itself is a source of motivation some people mm -hmm. can work during the day others are available at night after two weeks there is a change and all that so they get time to do other things all right uh yes you the the bankers i have a, a friend who works at the bank almost any other week you call i'm on leave um, why do people go and live like that? Evelyn. Is it Evelyn? Say, I'm not a banker. I'm not a banker. I don't um, work in the bank. You don't work in the bank? <laughs> okay. No, no. <laughs> ah, that, yeah, but I understand. The work is very demanding. So probably to deal with the stress part, they, they also have built in all manner of leaves. Okay. I am. It, it's surprising to me because of probably the nature of my work as well. We we work that today is Saturday, right? And I'm here. And yeah. it, sometimes it's not like they are even forcing you. If even you don't have anything, it's almost like you're addicted to the office. You still have yeah. to come yeah. and do your yeah. own things. Okay. So when mm -hmm. I call, I'm on leave or I'm on leave, it's kind of weird to me. Okay. <laughs> that's 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 the nature of their work as well. <laughs> okay. So uh, that's the idea of job splits between two or more persons. And they are all full-time people for that particular job. Then we have the telecommuting, sometimes called flexi place. So it's a work arrangement that allows at least a portion of scheduled work hours to be completed outside of the office with work at home as one of the options. Okay. So we are also a flexi place. And I think when I was talking about the tech companies, so there are companies that you don't necessarily have to be at the office, as in the fiscal place, workplace. With your computer and your internet, you can work anywhere around the world. In fact, there mm -hmm. are companies now in US that employ people. So we have Ghanaians here that are working for US companies, UK companies, and so on and so forth. Because you just need your, your laptop and the internet connectivity, and you are good to go. So as a manager, you also, you said? I said you should link us. Ah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying I'm the one. No. I said there are people. <laughs> and I know one student of mine, but she has even left for the UK, right? Yeah. She, uh, no, no, no. She, she's still around. Contact her so that she... She's still Contact around. Contact her so that she will link us. So, yes. <laughs> when the exchange rate was very yeah. bad, I, 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 I always, yes, yes, please. Yeah, as you were asking why bankers will always go for leave. Are you uh, a banker? A yes, sir. Uh -uh. And you it's didn't answer. It's a requirement. Yeah, I was in net, then, uh, yeah by net, uh, Bank of Ghana, sometimes to reduce cash suppression. Oh. Maybe we don't go at yeah. Oh, okay, I get it. So yeah. if you are not there, they can get to monitor your activities. Yes. Your activities. Oh, okay, 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 okay. And other okay. That's yeah. nice. I didn't know, but I thought because the work was stressful, so they want to no. 
kind that of is a stressful aspect by uh, to reduce cash suppressions and other dubious ways. Okay, right. So it's almost mandatory for you to leave. Yes, sir. So that you won't have the opportunity. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. I'll you sit in my next class. I'll talk as if I'm a banker. Uh, <laughs> I'll talk as, it's, it's an additional knowledge. I'll talk as if I work in the bank and I know about this. So thank you for that. Okay, so that's the idea of flexi place. You can rely on your computer and work anywhere in, in, in the world. And so as a manager, you have to also know how to deal with such employees. All these points are coming up because we have people, managers or leaders with a traditional mindset. They want people to be at the fiscal place so that they can control and boss them around. All right. So if even the work is such that the person can use his or a laptop and get things done, they will still want to get a person to come to work you have to know at what point, which part aspects of the work somebody can handle whilst not in the office and give them the luxury to be able to do that if they want to, okay? Yes, so that brings us to our discussion this morning on motivation. Uh, are there any questions? Or did you guys enjoy the lecture? Yeah. Was it okay, yeah? Yes, I personally enjoyed it. But okay. but I have a challenge with the the training at the training aspect. Eh? Yeah, yeah, where you have to split two people, probably one should come and then the other should come later on. This mm -hmm. one can it apply to sensitive areas, organizations like the banks, the the hospitals. Etc. I think the example because... that I used was actually the hospital. And the hospital, I was actually talking, I would say private hospitals, not government. Okay. Normally, if it is a private hospital, they have way of allowing this. You know, uh, the, the doctors, they engage in what they call locum or something. If you are yeah. a lecturer in our context, we call it galamsey, right? So... <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> yes so if it is a private hospital then they can because the guy is, is a specialist and he's full-time employed in say a government organization and he's supposed to close at say 5 p.m just an example so he may be able to drive from work to that place say in an hour's time or he may want to take some rest and come at 7 p.m okay from 7 p.m., he can work up to 9, 9 p.m. and probably go home and get rest or whatever, right? And he's, he's a specialist. You have cases like that that will bring you a lot of money. So why not? You have to employ somebody who will be prepared to work the normal hours. And this guy will come and do some two, three hours. Okay, and leave. okay, okay. All right, all right. Uh -huh. yeah. But I'm also saying that that same... Could exp this concept can go for the shifting normal shifting system that we know. Mm -hmm. If there's production, you don't want to keep your machines idle just because it's, it's night. It's now part mm -hmm. of the world that when it's even or night, you have to sleep. Okay? Elsewhere <laughs> at night, people still work at night. So instead mm -hmm. of leaving your, your machines and equipment idle, why not employ some set of people for the daytime and some people for the night? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that yeah. is the idea of the uh, training or job sharing. Okay. So thank you very much for your attention.